Let's take out our Bibles today and turn to the book of Exodus. We're going through the book of Exodus together as a church, and today we're going to look at snippets from three different chapters in Exodus. So turn to Exodus chapter 15 uh, in your Bibles, uh, if you would, Exodus chapter 15. Uh, Last week, we saw the people of Israel sing a song of celebration after they went through the waters of the Red Sea. And uh, today we're going to see them in the wilderness uh, before and with the Lord. So let's start out reading. Uh, If you guys would follow along in your Bibles or on the screen, Exodus 15, verse 22 is where we pick up the story. It says, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter, therefore it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, Then they set out from Elim. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord, verse 4, said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said in verse 8, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then, verse 9, Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, verse 13, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord commanded, gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take each an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. Now, if you guys would fast forward to chapter 17, verse 1, our third episode, it says, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, 
Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Oreb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this passage that like so many other passages in your word is like a mirror exposing so often what in our true nature at times we are like. Well, Lord, we don't want to be like these Israelite people, a, a complaining people, a people not trusting in you, a people forgetful of what you've done for them. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd use this passage to strengthen us. And, Lord, as you tested them, I pray, Lord, that you would bring testing into our lives, training us, Lord, for the best future that you have in store for us. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We rejoice in you this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Amen. Kevin, I'm getting a little bit of feedback up here. Okay, this is a long passage that we are looking at this morning. And uh, in this passage, I'm sure you notice there are these three main movements. And, and I think that these three main movements are meant to go together because there are some common threads that appear uh, throughout them. One major thread is that in each story, something or some place is named. They give a name to something. Uh, in the first episode, uh, they named the place Mara because uh, that word means bitter. And when they came to the water in the first episode, it was bitter. It was undrinkable. Uh, in the second location, 40 days later, uh, they named the bread from heaven manna, which means what is it? Because they didn't know at first what it was. And Moses had to tell them this is food from God. And in the last location, Moses actually named the place with two names, the place where water flowed from the rock. He called it Massa and Meribah, because Massa means testing, because they tested God, and Meribah means quarreling, because they had quarreled with Moses. So something is named in all three episodes. What this tells us is that in each place, there was a momentous lesson the people of God we're supposed to learn. And these are lessons that you and I are supposed to learn uh, today. Uh, but those are not the only threads that appear all throughout this passage. Uh, for instance, at each location, at uh, the bitter waters, at the wilderness with the manna, and at the water that, uh, or rock that produced water, uh, the people complain. And we're going to think about that today. Each episode, uh, shows the people grumbling about, and this is a little ironic on Thanksgiving weekend, they were grumbling about food and drink. They got thirsty or they got hungry and they panicked and they cried out to God about it. Another common thread throughout the whole passage is that God provides. In each stage, at each place, God provides for them. God takes care of them. He meets their needs. And that leads to another major theme between these three episodes, all three of these places were places of testing. Uh, in the opening story, God tests them with a statute and a rule. And we're going to talk about that at the close of our time together this morning. Uh, in the middle story, God said that he would test the people of Israel with the manna. How was he testing them there? Well, he told them that they should only take what was required for the day, not store up for tomorrow, and that on the sixth day, they should trust that God was going to provide for the Sabbath, that they wouldn't need to go out on the Sabbath day, but that there would be enough from what they'd collected on the sixth day. It was a test to see, will you obey the word that I said? Do you believe my promises or not? And in the final episode, God is not the one testing Israel. Israel is the one presented as testing God. They tested the Lord, it says two times in that passage. So these three episodes are episodes of testing. And so 
That's what we're going to think about today, the complaining of the people of Israel, the provision of God for those complaining people, and the tests that God brought them through uh, in this passage. So the first theme that I want to look at, like I said, is the complaining nature of the Hebrew people. Uh, If you've read the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, you know that this is a repeated theme. This is not the only time that the people of Israel complain. It's kind of their uh, standard operating procedure. They get a little panicked, they get a little fearful, and pretty soon complaints start spilling out of their mouths. In fact, the biblical word that's used is the word grumbling. Isn't that a good word? The word grumbling. It's, it's not just a complaint, it's not just an issue, but it's a continual muttering about it. It's a grumbling that they are giving to Moses and directing towards God. Uh, in this passage, they're presented as complaining or grumbling at all three locations. Uh, first, they come to this place called Mara, where three days after their victory at the Red Sea, they're thirsty. Maybe they're running out of water supplies. They're starting to panic a little bit. They see a water source and they think, we're saved. They approach it and they realize that it is undrinkable water and they begin to complain against Moses and God. Now, God led Moses to do a remarkable thing, a a counterintuitive thing. God showed him a log or a piece of wood or a branch or a tree, uh, depending on how you want to translate the Hebrew word for it, and he throws it in the water And the water becomes sweet, naturally. That's what happens when you throw wood into water, as we all know. Water miracle. The people of Israel had seen the most magnificent water source that they probably had ever laid eyes on, the Nile River, turned undrinkable by God. Now God is taking undrinkable water, and he's making it drinkable for his people. This is teaching them about who they are in God's sight. Okay, a month later, they run out of food. And again, they grumble, this time against Moses and his brother Aaron. They throw Aaron into the mix. They get a little dramatic. If you look at chapter 16, verse 3, they say, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It's like you read that and you think, what book of Exodus are you guys reading? When did that happen? When were you guys just chilling by meat pots, whatever that is? That's not really what I want to hang out by, but you're you're chilling with all this meat, all this food, all this abundance. No, they were slaves, but it was a selective memory that they brought to Moses. So Moses prayed. God told him that he was about to rain bread from heaven upon them. It's an interesting statement from God. It's only the fourth time that rain is mentioned in the Bible The first three times, every time up to this point that rain is mentioned, it's judgment. The rain of the flood, the rain of judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, the rain of the plague of hail and fire that was brought upon the Egyptians. And in my reading, I'm like, this is a time where God should rain down something like that upon the Israelites. But what does he rain down upon them? Not judgment, but bread from heaven. It shows how he feels about these people. Then in our last episode, their complaining spirit uh, developed what I would call lawsuit overtones against God because they start quarreling with Moses and they test the Lord. They were thirsty again. They needed water to go with their daily miracle manna meal. So they accused Moses of bringing them out there to kill their children. It's quite a, a claim that they bring against Moses. They were ready to stone Moses, which means they wanted to kill him with by pummeling him with rocks. So God responded to their threats by standing on a rock in front of Moses. He told Moses to strike the rock and water came out of it and the people drank. Now, a lot of their complaining, if I think we're honest, is natural enough. You know, they're coming to the end of their water supply. uh, They're hungry. They don't know where fresh water is going to come from. And their complaints begin. They start to panic. In fact, it's not hard for us to imagine, as easy it is to make fun of the Israelites because they're not here today, uh, it's not hard for us to imagine ourselves doing the very same things if we were in the situations or the predicaments that they were in. But there's also something about this whole trilogy of episodes that is intensely childish and immature. 
Have you ever seen a little child so bored or so hungry or so tired or so thirsty that it's like their bones melt and they just fall on the floor? It's like their mom or dad is like, get up. They're like, I can't get up. I am so bored of going grocery shopping with you. And they pick them up and they're like a noodle flopping around on the ground, you know, kind of thing. That, that's what the people of Israel appear like in this episode. Like, I'm starving. I can't move. That's how they seem to behave. Now, we know that maturity means facing difficulties with trust and confidence in the Lord. Trust and confidence in the Lord doesn't erase difficulties. But maturity means we face those difficulties with a trust and a confidence in the Lord. Our, our posture is straight. We're believing God. He's going to see us through. But before we jump straight into beating ourselves up about times that we grumble and complain, I think it would be good for us to ask the question, what fueled their grumbling? I think there are two things that really fueled the grumbling of the people of Israel. I think on one hand, we would have to say they had terrible memories, didn't they? I mean, they, they just seem to have not been able to put into their little brains or their computer uh, all of the past uh, performance of God. The ten plagues, uh, the Red Sea, they seem to have omitted that from their memory. Uh, some of you are the youngest child in your family, and your older siblings and your parents have memories that you were there for that you do not remember. You know, like say there's a third child, fourth child, and the family went to Disneyland when they were two years old. There's photographic evidence. Uh, the older siblings have memories, but that two-year-old, when they grow up to be a 10-year-old, they're like, it never happened. I don't remember it. That's not my experience because I can't recall it. And the people of Israel, it's like that's happened to them already. They've forgotten all that God has done. And we as God's people, we need to remember God's past faithfulness to us, especially his faithfulness at the cross of Christ. Uh, but there was something else that the people of Israel uh, also did that I think lent to their grumbling spirit. Not only did they forget what God had done for them, uh, but they let their feelings of hunger and thirst, their base bodily appetites, become the measuring stick of their quality of life. Their thirst, then their hunger, then their thirst made them think all about themselves, which meant they were not thinking about or trusting God. We have to be on guard against a tendency to judge our circumstances against or by our stomachs, by our appetites, by our desires. Philippians tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that we need to do all things without grumbling or disputing. And we need exhortations like that uh, time and time again because we often drift into that complaining spirit. Now the wild thing about complaining or grumbling, is that we know how unpleasant or annoying it is when someone else does it. <laughs> we somehow give ourselves a pass, think that we're justified in it, but have you ever been in a relationship with a chronic grumbler? It's just an unpleasant experience. Over time, you begin to avoid that person because you already know where the conversation is going to go. Uh, maybe an analogy to describe this would be like, a cookie jar with incredible tasting cookies inside of it. Everybody wants to visit that cookie jar, pull out a cookie, but imagine that you then put into the jar another batch of cookies that look the same, have the same texture, but are terrible tasting, completely bitter. Half the cookie's good, half the cookie's bitter. Over time, people will cease putting their hand in that cookie jar because they want to avoid that experience. And this happens to us. The more we complain, the less people will risk our company. Or worse, we'll be soon surrounded only by those who join us in grumbling and complaining. Our little club of grumbling and complaining people. No, the Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 29 that we should let no corrupting talk come out of our mouths, but only such as is good for building up that it may give grace to those who hear. The question we want to ask ourselves is, 
Do my words add life to another person? Or through grumbling and complaining, am I depleting their resources? Now, I want to be someone who gives grace to those who hear with my words, and I'm sure you want the same. The Proverbs instruct every one of us in Proverbs 4.23 to keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Your heart is like soil from which a good garden can grow, but complaining and grumbling put weeds in that garden, choking out the fruit that could have been. And since the tendency to grumble is there in all of us, I think we have to constantly tend to this area of our lives. I issued a challenge in the first service. I'll issue one to you in this service as well. Uh, But that verse that I read in Ephesians 4.29 about letting no corrupting word come out of your mouths, only that which imparts grace to the hearer, only that which is building up the other person, I'd encourage you until the new year to pray that verse every day for your life and see what happens. I'm willing to bet that you'll see a shift occur, not just in you, but in your relationships and interactions with other people. Ask God to produce that in you. Make that commitment to him each morning and say, God, would you help me today? I don't want poison to come out of my mouth, but I want life to come out of my mouth. So that's my challenge in that portion of the text. Okay, the second uh, thread that I wanted to think about today is the thread of uh, God's provision for his people at all three locations. I mean, frankly, it's a little bit amazing that that's what God decided to do at all three locations, right? I mean, even as we're reading it out loud, you kind of are like waiting for this moment where God just snaps, you know, and he's like, I've had enough of you guys. I've had enough of all this complaining. Do you know the things I have done for you? You know, let me recount all the plagues and the Red Sea and all of that. But instead, God hears their complaint and he provides for his people. He's teaching them. He's training them. He provides for them. What was God teaching them through these episodes? Well, I think a major lesson has to have been, I am your provider. He wanted them to look to him for their provision. Uh, When they went into the promised land in their future, uh, it would be tempting for them to trust their network of relationships with the surrounding people groups, which would jeopardize Jewish Hebrew culture and their allegiance to God's word and might cause them to be erased as a people, which would jeopardize the salvation plan that God had instituted from the Garden of Eden Uh, In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Messiah, the Savior, would come from this people. He needed them to be distinct. He needed them to be a special people. And for that, they needed to trust that no matter what, God was going to take care of them. As they walked with God in obedience, he would supply their every need according to his riches in glory. And in these early episodes, They're meant to be teachable moments, like core memories for the people of Israel that would help them trust God in the future. They were to draw upon these three stories for thousands of years. God will provide for us. Remember how when the water was bitter, he made it sweet. Remember when there was no food, he gave us manna for 40 years. Remember when there was no water, water came from the rock. God provides and takes care of us, they would say to one another. The passage even tells us, we didn't read this part, but in the end of chapter 16, God commanded Moses to take some manna, put it in a jar, and put that jar inside the Ark of the Covenant as a perpetual testimony, bearing witness that God is their provider. And what I want to say to you today is that I think the text gives us a little clue that this is one of God's favorite ways to reveal himself to his people. Why do I say that? Well, up to this point, wouldn't you agree with me that God has done some pretty glorious and amazing things in the book of Exodus? Wouldn't you say that God has done some powerful things in the book of Exodus? But it says in chapter 16, verse 7, that when the manna came, God said to the people, then they will see the glory of the Lord. It's like in God's mind, Everything I've done has been powerful, beautiful, wonderful, and necessary, but my provision for my people, that's where they're going to see 
my glory in their lives. So God's heart for his people, one of his favorite things to do was to provide for them. And if this is true, then I think we'd expect to find the same heart repeated in the New Testament, and we do. When Jesus taught us how to pray, one of the things that he said was this. He said, give us this day our daily bread. Just embedded in that statement from Jesus is the expectation that if we're God's children, when will we pray? Occasionally? Once a month? No, every day. Unless you're the kind of person that's like, I like to eat one day and then I take four or five days off and then I eat the next day. No, I'm not that kind of person. I like to eat every day. And he says, this is how you pray. Let, give us this day, today, our daily bread. I love the communal aspect of that prayer. It's not give me this day my daily bread. It's give us. I'm part of a community. God, there might be people that are hurting. There might be people that aren't as well off as I am. Give us this day our daily bread. And I like the claim to being God's children that is embedded in that prayer. God, there is daily bread that belongs to me. You have set it aside for me, and I'm asking now that as my heavenly Father, you would distribute it into my life today. But it's a daily prayer for today's bread. You know, God didn't give Israel this big Costco-sized supply of manna. You know, first day of the month, go out there, just you know, bring your cart and bring it home, and I'll see you in a month. No, God said, every day, I want you to go out six days a week, and on the sixth day, there will be enough for day seven so that you can Sabbath before me. You see, he wanted them to live in dependence upon him. If you read Israel's story, one thing you'll discover is that any time they experienced abundance and prosperity, even from the Lord, as a result of walking with him and obeying him, oftentimes their hearts would stray the abundance kept them from daily dependence upon God. And so God is trying to train them. No matter how much you have, no matter how little you have, I want you to be a person of daily dependence upon me. Uh, my, my dog at home, he's just this little guy that he kind of will just like, when it comes to his dog food, he just eats as much as he needs to eat. We could probably just put like a week's supply out there and he would just slowly pick at it over a few days. But some of you guys have pets where you can't do that. You know that however much food you put out there, 15 seconds later, it's gonna be gone. And so what do you do? Do you give them a week's supply and let them kill themselves through overeating? No, you give them, you meet it out. Here's your morning portion. Here's your evening portion. And that seems to be what God is doing with the people of Israel. He's showing them, you need to have a slow, daily dependence upon me. Now, when it comes to the manna, I've always felt that there's something really beautiful and devotional about that passage. I mean, I, to me, it's always said that, Nate, you got to go get your spiritual bread from the Lord every single day. I've often thought of the manna as a proverb encouraging me to get up every morning and meditate on scripture for myself. They had to get up before the sun grew hot so that the manna would not melt. And I've considered my daily time in God's word the same way. I gotta get up early and get it for myself. You can't get it for me and I can't get it for you. We gotta go out and get God's word, bring it into our lives. Jesus said that we live off God's word. And that he's the true bread, Jesus is, who came down from heaven. So when I look at this passage through my Jesus lens, it tells me to get up every morning and spend time with the word of God as a way to spend time with Jesus. My battery drains every day just like yours does. And only time with Jesus and his word can bring me back to full charge. And we all, just like ancient Israel, we have a decision to make about that. Will we go out and get it? But I know for me and my house, I don't want to go hungry. I want to eat, so I want to go get the word. But though that might be the spiritual lesson of this passage, we should not miss just the actual basic lesson of this passage. God provides for his people, and he wants his people to trust him for that provision. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. After telling the multitudes that God takes care of the fields and the birds of the air, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
Put God, put his priorities and the constant pursuit of godliness at the center of who you are and all these things, what things? Food, shelter, provision will be added to you. God cares for the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, but he cares more for his people. Now, this is a huge area that we need to trust God in. The Bible says that we should trust the Lord with all our heart. And finances are a huge area that we are tested in our trust of him. You know, in this area of life, we might need faith to be content with what we have rather than overextend ourselves, believing that Proverbs, like Proverbs 15, 17, better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox with, and hatred with it. Believing Proverbs like that are true. Even in a case like this, we have to trust that life with God can be a rich experience, even if we don't have the square footage, the vacations, the clothing, or the cars that others have. Just as you cannot quench your thirst with salt water, so you cannot find satisfaction with material goods or bodily experiences. But we also might need to express financial faith by being generous. Nothing shouts dependence on God like giving to someone else. Or we might need to merely express faith in God by refusing to compromise in order to get money. Too many people have ditched church, refused to Sabbath, or cut ethical corners in pursuit of the almighty dollar. In all these instances and more, God is looking for us to trust him. He will provide if we give him a chance. Okay, the last theme, though, that we're going to look at today is... uh, Probably the most important theme for them and the most important theme for us, it's that God tested the people of Israel. There's a a theme of testing that reverberates throughout the whole trilogy. Uh, Like I said, in the first two, uh, God said he would test them, but in the final episode, they test God. In fact, it's very strong how they tested God. It says in chapter 17, verse 3, that they grumbled and quarreled with Moses They accused Moses of bringing them out of Egypt to kill them, their children, and their livestock. Uh, Moses called it the place of testing because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Their testing of God was punitive. They're saying to God, if you don't do what we want, we will rebel against you. Their testing of God was legal. They're saying, God, you need to come to our courtroom and we will judge you. And third, their testing of God was totally forgetful. They concluded with, is God with us or not? I mean, by this point in the book of Exodus, the answer is like, yes, duh, he's definitely with you. Uh, But they'd forgotten, and so they were testing the Lord. But but when God tested them, it wasn't like their testing of God. It was very different. I, I know a lot of us probably have real negative connotations in our minds with the word test. We don't like that word. I know for me, one of the first places I go is I think about uh, being 16 years old or 15, yeah, 16 years old and taking my driver's test. You know, it's a, it's a stressful thing. And, uh, and I had to take it a couple of times. I'm not going to lie with you guys today. You know, I, 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 I approached that first stoplight and uh, there was a left-hand turn and the light was red turning left but green going straight. I grew up in Pacific Grove. I don't think we had even one left-hand turn lane in the whole town. And so they, she said, turn left at the intersection, red light turning left. I went right through it. She held onto her seat, looked a little bit stressed out. And then we went right back to the DMV. And I was like, wow, that was super quick. And uh, she's like, do you know why you failed? And I was like, why don't you tell me why I failed? And I'll tell you whether I know the reason why I failed. We, we don't like the word test. You know, it conjures up images of great, being graded or past pass or fail, or being compared to others. We think of the pressure, the performance, the study sessions, all of that. Okay, that's, that's not what is happening with God. God's tests are more like training. They're training designed to build us up for a better way of life. This is why God tested them. Uh, when it came to the seventh day, you know, going out to get the manna, He tested them with that seventh day thing. Were they going to go out to try to find manna on the Sabbath? Or would they trust what God had said about resting on the seventh day? 
Would they believe that God would double their supply on day six, or would they ignore his word and fend for themselves? But why was that a test? Why was that a test? Well, in a few short chapters, the people of Israel are going to receive the Ten Commandments from God, and then they're going to receive a whole litany of laws that extend from those Ten Commandments. And if they failed the test of obeying these, this very basic rule from God, then they certainly weren't going to be inclined to be diligent to obey his larger structure of laws governing their lives. But on the other hand, if they proved that God was faithful when they obeyed him, you know, we didn't go out on day seven and there was manna there in the pot. Uh, God does double our supply on that sixth day. It would train them for those 10 commandments to say, now whatever God says, I know it's gonna work out if we just follow his directives for our lives. I think this is what Jesus meant when he said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from God's mouth. I, I think what he was saying was it wasn't manna that fulfilled the people of Israel in that day, but it was the word or the command from God's mouth that fulfilled them. God promised that it would be there for the first six days of the week, and on the seventh, they needed to trust that God's word was faithful. And I think this testing is rooted in a shocking development in the first episode, which we're going to revisit now. After turning the bitter water sweet, look at chapter 15, verse 25. It says that God introduced a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do that which is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. What I want to say here is that up to this point in the book of Exodus, God has not talked like this. The things that he's done for the people of Israel up to this point have been elective. They have been his sovereign choice. There has not been a lot of, if you do this, I will do this. But here, God introduces that to them. If you, then I will. This rule is filled with that, if you will, then I will language. God's promises here become not unconditional, but conditional. If they listen to God's voice and do what is right in his eyes, if they keep his commandments, then he will be their healer. Now, to me, it's unfortunate that these conditional promises are shocking to many modern Christians. Many modern Christians have been deceived into thinking that the cross lets them live however they choose to live. So we go out, we do our own thing, and we wonder why our lives are a mess. Sometimes they're a mess because of trials that come into our lives, but often life becomes messier than it needs to be because we have ignored God's word. Again, this should not be shocking. We would never ignore the directions when baking a cake. We would never ignore the architectural plans when building a house. We would never ignore the proper instructions when learning a musical instrument. If we do those things, the cake will be bad, the house will not stand, and the music will be terrible. So we should not be shocked when God gives us the ingredients that lead to the best life the plans that build a legacy of righteousness or the sequence of notes that makes life's song soar. But so often, we tell ourselves that the if you will, I will does not apply to us. It's important to know that the people of Israel at this point, they totally belong to God. He is not saying, if you do this, then I will make you my people. He's not saying, if you do this, then you belong to me. They belong to him. He purchased them with the blood of the Passover lamb. They were his. He'd already called them my firstborn son. They are mine. This is not him saying, this is how you earn a relationship with me. He's saying, this now for you 
as my covenant people is how the world works. So follow my dictates and blessings will flow. But of course, some of them ignored God's word. They tried to save up manna overnight, and we didn't read it, but there's actually a line in there in Exodus 16 that says, and it bred worms and stank. And others went out on the seventh day looking for manna, even though God said the six-day supply would miraculously double. Uh, It was all designed to train these slaves, ex-slaves, to rest in God's commands. Let's live the way that God tells us to live because it works. This was preparing them for the Ten Commandments. All right, so what about us? You know, there are times that the Lord will say to us, uh, don't walk in the counsel of the world. Be sexually clean. Keep your marriage vows if you're a married person. Practice contentment and generosity. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. There are constant exhortations throughout the New Testament that lead to beautiful results in life if we would yield ourselves to them. All right, now at this point, uh, all of us are feeling a little bit like the Israelites. We're feeling like, okay, I'm a grumbling uh, person who God does take care of, but who fails lots of tests. And what I want to tell you today is that uh, the same series of tests that they endure, they are tests that we endure as well. We often fail them, but because of Jesus, we can overcome because he overcame. You know, Jesus faced all these temptations. He faced all these difficulties, and he passed them with flying colors. And when you believe and trust in Jesus, his spirit comes to reside within you. And as you walk with him, he can help you overcome in all of these different areas of life. So the Lord is the one that we need to look to. Which leads us, of course, to the communion table today. If you take out your bread and cup that hopefully you picked up on your way in today. Listen to the word of Jesus from John chapter 6. This is his commentary on the manna passage that we read today. He said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And sometimes people say that Jesus is just a good teacher or a great prophet, you know, someone who had great spiritual lessons for us to embrace. What kind of good teacher says stuff like that? Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. Only Jesus can say that. He goes on to say, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So as we hold this bread and this cup in our hands, we are not holding the literal body or blood of Jesus in our hands, but we are holding emblems of the the real thing. You're not saved by eating this bread or drinking this cup, but you are given life by believing in Jesus, what he came to do for you and to do for me. So let's partake of him together. Lord, we stand before you today a thankful people. You have, Lord, provided for us. All our shortcomings and deficiencies you made a way for in the cross. And we rejoice in you, O Lord. 
in so many true ways. Lord, this bread and cup that you have given us to remember you with, it is the best meal that we have eaten all weekend. Speaking to us of the grace, the mercy, the love, the covenant that you have made with us as your people. And so now, Lord, we invite your training into our lives. We want to be a people who yield ourselves more fully to you and your ways. Believing, Lord, that we have so far to go, but we want, Lord, to drink in of that life that you have designed for us. Bring us further, we pray. We thank you for your provision in your body and your blood. We love you, Lord, and rejoice in you.